I'm very excited to introduce our presenter, Dr. Jeremy Pittman. Jeremy Pittman is an assistant professor in the University of Waterloo School of Planning. His research focuses on environmental governance and policy, and he works with a diverse range of communities and sectors in Canada and internationally on sustainability, sustainability oriented projects. Before joining the University of Waterloo, he worked for both provincial and federal governments in Canada, as well as the private sector on issues related to the resilience of rural agricultural and fisheries based communities for social and ecological change. He has also held several prestigious fellowships and awards, most notably the Liber Era Fellowship for Young Conservation Scientists. Um, welcome, Jeremy, and hope everyone else welcomes him too. Awesome. Yeah, so as Adam was saying, my name is Jeremy Pittman. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Waterloo School of Planning. Um, I'm going to be speaking with you today, um, you know, about this idea, the title of my talk, which is essentially, how do we start identifying entry points for increasing adaptive capacity in small scale fishing communities. Um, before I get going, I just want to say, we've definitely been thinking about you all in BC the last few days with everything going on and hope that you're all doing okay and your family and your friends are all safe. Um, it's been, you know, a lot to deal with, I'm sure. Um, and I just hope you're, you're all coming through it okay. Um, I also, I wasn't sure exact protocols, you know, because this is a webinar, but I also just wanted to acknowledge the land that I'm standing on right now. Um, and this is, you know, official statement from the University of Waterloo, but essentially the University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional ter territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Um, our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, community building, and is centralized with the Office of, of Indigenous Relations. Um, you know, and just acknowledge myself, um, you know, as an academic part of Canada's education system, uh, settler here, uh, grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan. These ideas of a reconciliation are pretty important to me and, you know, pretty big responsibility that we, we need to take on. Um, the other thing I just wanted to acknowledge before we get going are some of my collaborators for this work. So um, I'll get into this a little bit more in a minute, but I'll give you sort of an overview of adaptive capacity, what we kind of know about it. Um, but I also just wanted to acknowledge that, you know, I have a lot of great collaborators and colleagues in the field that I'm working with all this stuff on. I have them listed there, but um, Rivier Sebastian, uh, Zethro Barron, Derek Theophile, and Julian Defoe, all with the Dominica Fisheries Division. I've been working with them for a long time. It's been really great to work with and just wanted to acknowledge your contributions to this work as well. Um, yeah, so stepping back a bit, give you a bit of an overview of my talk. As I mentioned, um, I'll go through a little bit and just give you a background on adaptive capacity research. Um, some of you might be familiar with this, um, but uh, essentially just, you know, where, where, where it came from, where it's going, that type of thing, what have been some of the main contributions um, to date. And then I'll go into a case study from Dominica, which is um, you know, a place I've worked in for a few years where you know, we work with a lot of coastal communities and small scale fishing communities trying to address um, climate and environmental changes. Um, it's also a place that gets impacted uh, relatively frequently with hurricanes or other large storms. Um, so you know, there's that idea of building resilience to these events as well. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll give you some, you know, kind of an overview of some of the work that we've done there. All right, so just to begin with, um, uh, you know, this idea of adaptive capacity, where does it come from? Um, my, my understanding of the roots of, of a lot of adaptive capacity scholarship are in sort of the scholarship on vulnerability. That's sort of how I came to it and um, the lens through uh, that I learned it from. Um, you know, in vulnerability research, it was really big, you know, 10, 15 years ago, where um, people that were doing climate change research were really interested in the concept of vulnerability. And um, vulnerability was often conceptualized, as I said, you know, there's some kind of function of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Um, and in this literature, adaptive capacity was really, you know, meant sort of what this diagram is trying to, to, trying to display here is that adaptive capacity sort of moderates, you know, how um, sensitive or how exposed um, a community or a system is. Um, exposure refers to just like what's what's the propensity for harm or what, what sort of um, uh, you know what sort of um, physical stressors or, or socioeconomic stressors um, might impact you. Um, sensitivity is how much they matter. Why do they matter? That type of thing. Um, are your livelihoods dependent on it? You know, it's, it gets into that type of stuff. Um, and adaptive capacity, as the name suggests, relates to the idea of um, how much. A certain system can can actually adapt, or how much they can moderate um, um, the effects of these different events. 
Um, with sort of the, the boom in resilience scholarship that a lot of you are probably aware of, um, adaptive capacity sort of took on a slightly different meaning. Um, these two diagrams, by the way, are from a, a really great paper by Nathan Engel from 2011, Global Environmental Change, where he kind of maps out a lot of this um, transition. But um, essentially, uh, in the resilience scholarship, where you're thinking more about um, you know, uh, system states and that type of thing, um, less desirable versus more desirable states. One of the ways that adaptive capacity is often treated is, you know, systems with more adaptive capacity are more likely to be in a more desirable state is one way to think of it. Um, there's a lot of questions, as you probably are aware of, in the resilience scholarship around more desirable for who and that type of thing, who gets to interpret that. Um, but, you know, that's kind of a generally how um, adaptive capacity works um, in this scholarship. Um, the other thing that I would highlight here is you'll notice um, in, in at least in Nathan Engel's take on it, there's um, some relationship between adaptive capacity and transformed or so, you know, potentially he's drawn some linkages there between adaptive capacity and what people might actually call transformative capacity. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, um, there still is that, that element kind of built in where, you know, some resilient scholars might say adaptive capacity is just about working within, um, you know, a resilient system or trying to maintain that system and transformative capacity somewhere something else you might have seen some framings like that before um, but you know there is some scholarship out there that where adaptive capacity kind of encompasses both so i'll just mention that um this is a uh you know there's a really great synthesis done by charlotte whitney uh, nathan bennett and others um, a few years back um, that you know went through and looked at a bunch of different approaches for adaptive capacity research in coastal communities um, and, you know, I really like this diagram because it kind of synthesizes a lot of the different methods and, and, you know, the ways that we try to study these phenomenon. Um, so this is a way to read it. So you have different social scales on this side, the range from global down to individual. Ecological scales on this side, they range again from global down to a certain population or, or a stock. Um, and then as you kind of move through the spectrum here, it ranges from fully ecological approaches, more integrated approaches, and more social approaches. So um, I think this really reflects just the diverse ways and the diverse disciplines that have contributed to adaptive capacity scholarship over time. Um, and, you know, I won't go through necessarily all of it, but just highlight a few things like, you know, on the, on the ecological side, what a lot of scholars would use are large scale ecological indicators or models. Um, maybe things like ecopath, ecosim potentially, things like that, or just looking at different um, uh, ecological indicators that relate to adaptive capacity. Um, on the social side, you, there's a, you know ranges from qualitative community-based work to um, more sort of quantitative survey-based work. Um, historical ethnographic, ethnographic approaches are pretty important, um, uh, as well as governance approaches, large scale indicators. Um, and then in between, there's sort of everything from your mixed methods, integrated modeling, uh, experiments, and participatory approaches. Um, just to kind of foreshadow a little bit, the things that I'm going to be talking to you about today kind of draw a little bit from qualitative community based work, a little bit of survey work, as well as some governance work. Um, uh, and yeah, I'll get I'll get into that stuff a little bit more in a minute, but that's sort of you know the the talk that I'll I'll be given in a minute when I when I focus on the case study. Um, this is a diagram a framework that was produced by Sinner Joshua Sinner AL a few years back um, that really you know in my mind reflects a lot of um, uh, you know it's a really good synthesis of everything that we had learned about adaptive capacity up to that point. Um, you know, it focuses on these five key dimensions of adaptive, adaptive capacity, which are assets, flexibility, organization, learning, and agency. Um, a lot of original adaptive capacity work really just focused on assets. Um, there's a big push to look at, you know, things like natural capital, institutional capital, um, those types of things, um, and sort of within that assets kind of livelihoods frameworks. Um, that's where a lot of adapt adaptive capacity assessments were done. Um, since then, there was a lot of focus on learning um, as, as playing a role in adaptive capacity. A lot of work by Derek Armitage kind of focuses on learning. Um, organization, that's where um, the networks and elements of structure start to fit in a little bit. Um, so, you know, that's where it becomes about collective action and just how risks and actions and decisions and resources and that type of thing are distributed across communities or how communities get access to those different things. Um, Flexibility is related to, as the name suggests, you know, just having 
uh, the possibility of changing course um, within this as well. In a lot of climate change literature, we often talk about the idea of no regrets or low regrets. Um, so that's essentially, you know, when you're when you're trying to address some kind of concern, you want to pick actions that will work um, in the broadest range of, of future of possible futures possible, essentially. Um, but you know, so you're looking at doing things that'll help you address sort of multiple risks um, or just multiple ways that a certain situation will, will unfold. Um, and finally, agency. Um, that one is critically important. And, you know, one of the things about adaptive capacity that's kind of interesting is that a lot of times we think of it as almost like a latent variable or it's something that's latent. It's like out there and it exists. Um, but you, you, you can only really observe it through indicators or through the actions of people. So, you know, that's where agency plays a really key part. Um, agency kind of helps actualize adaptive capacity. Um, and it includes things like, you know, just in the context of, of um, small scale fishing communities, it's things like, you know, fishers being able to uh, pursue the futures they want, how fish how they want, that type of thing, um, have basically have, have the lives that they want. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it plays a big role in, in how some of the other capacities actually play out. Yeah, and the last thing that I'll mention just on the background of adaptive capacity, and again, this is from Nathan Engel's paper, but um, there's this really interesting, not really a dichotomy, but just a cycle that research goes through. Um, and, you know, a lot of the research to date has really focused on applying theory, and that's, you know, things like diagnosing or characterizing capacity based on indicators. So you would develop a list of indicators that you think or that you assume have some kind of relationship to adaptive capacity and you'd kind of do inventories of those to characterize um, what adaptive capacity might look like for a certain community. And you might use that, you, you know, drawing on some theory to diagnose what you might um, do to improve adaptive capacity in that community. That's where, you know, a lot of, of research has been to date. Um, and there's, you know, some emerging research in this area, which is a little bit more around um, not necessarily just applying theory, but also building theory. So how do you actually start measuring these capacities um, in a little bit more robust way um, and actually comparing that to outcomes, testing hypotheses, things like that, um, or just inductively trying to figure out how things have worked based on looking at um, how things have evolved over history, you know, um, that type of thing. Uh, Again, the, the talk that I'm going to give today focuses mostly on this side, to be honest, um, but uh, it's kind of, it was a project where we were hoping to do a little bit of both, but kind of got disrupted by the pandemic. So maybe it'll, it'll uh, turn around in the future, but um, yeah, the stuff I'll be talking to you mostly today will be around sort of more applying theory and, and things like that. All right, so switch into the case study a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, it's a case study of Dominica. Um, Sorry, I just got to move your camera so I can see my screen. Um, so Dominica is over here, Lesser Antilles, Eastern Caribbean. Um, it's not the Dominican Republic. So a lot of times when you talk about Dominica, um, people always think you're talking about the Dominican Republic, but, um, but you know, it's a completely different country, um, uh, still in the Caribbean, but, you know, very different context. Um, yeah, it's sort of, you know, people in Dominica speak uh, Creole, kind of a, a mix of French and um, some African languages. Um, uh, it's uh, one of the, the, probably the main sort of um, uh, economic sectors, agriculture, but fisheries is still pretty important. Um, as you can imagine, uh, anything to produce food in this region can be really important for the economy and well-being and things like that. Um, yeah, and just, uh, you know, some other characteristics about it, it's, it's, uh, base, uh, it's basically a volcano that just rises out of the ocean. So, you know, compared to some of the other islands where they have more beach and things like that, and they just kind of, it's a little bit more of a smooth transition. Dominique is just basically like a big volcano that popped out of the, out of the ocean. So it's a little bit more abrupt. The water gets really deep off the coast of Dominica really quick. Um, so you have like, you know, basically like one of the things that distinguishes the small scale fishing in Dominica a little bit from the from island, other islands that it's close to is just like there's a lot more what they would call offshore fishing. So fishing for pelagics more so than just going for reef fishes. Um, uh, so that's kind of one, you know, they, they do that in the other in the other islands as well. But um, in Dominica, just a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more pronounced just because of the, the way that the ocean works there. Um, yeah, and just kind of roughly the, the data that I'm drawing on for this. So I've been working in, in Dominica since about 2014, um, started my PhD work there. And so uh, 
you know, some of the, some of the, basically what I'm going to present to you today is a bit of a synthesis across these different data sets um, using some qualitative analysis techniques, um, but essentially uh, 56 interviews from 2014, 2018, another 24 interviews, which is right after, or, you know, about a, a few months after um, Hurricane Maria had passed through Dominica. Um, and then uh, the last kind of piece of, of data that we're using um, are some, we did a fishing, daily fishing trip surveys. We have data on about 344 trips. And this is the part that got interrupted by, um, by the pandemic and hoping to start up again soon. So yeah, what I wanted to do now is just kind of walk you through some of the findings that are coming out of the interviews and you know, highlight um, some, of the, some of the things that I think are important for increasing the adaptive capacity of small scale fishing communities in Dominica. Um, and the first one, you know, this probably isn't, isn't, a lot of, isn't a big surprise, but just acknowledging the importance of community. Um, and so the quote there kind of exemplifies um, uh, you know, some, some fishers experiences kind of creating these, these, these groups that, um, uh, that they use to, you know, work together, be more efficient, produce better quality fish, all that kind of stuff. Um, this, these groups also play a role in learning, um, uh, you know, and, and just sort of processing what's happening in terms of events. Um, they kind of come together, talk about what's going on, figure out how to address it, that type of thing. Um, one thing I would mention, you know, so drawing this back to some of the stuff I was telling you about uh, the center framework and things like that. Um, some of these examples don't always fit neatly into each of those categories. You know, this one here, for example, would probably highlight um, the organization's piece because we're talking about networks and it's how people come together and, and approach things collectively. But um, there's also, as you can observe, there's some of this um, interaction with some of the learning, for example, because, you know, they're talking about um, educating each other um, uh, through the meetings and, you know, talking about the best ways um, that they can move forward and things like that so it probably kind of uh, you know aligns with multiple dimensions of adaptive capacity um, but you know it's pretty important nonetheless uh, the other one that comes out really important is just this whole idea of you know promoting the love of fishing which is probably mostly related to the agency part of of the framework right um, but you know essentially uh, fishing for for some individuals is, is like you know they 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 essentially it's it's a big part of their life right they they love it they would not choose anything different um, you know it's pretty important to them you know as a quote here kind of exemplifies people are, are are pretty attached to the sea or some people are like like some of the fish some of the fishers that are out there are um, you know extremely sort of like um, attached to the sea they can't really see themselves doing much else um, and you know so when it comes to adaptation. In some cases, it's not about alternative livelihoods, right? It's about how do we make um, uh, these fishing livelihoods better? Um, and that's just always gonna be a fact in, 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 in some of these places. Um, uh, yeah, the other thing that, that, that I would note about some of this, so um, when it comes down to promoting the love of fishing, like um, in Dominica, even though they do rely on fishing quite a bit, the, um, there still is sort of a focus, like the, the, the fishing and, and, and the sea are almost thought of as last resort for a lot of people. They don't get a lot of attention um, from policy or, or otherwise. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it, it's, it's um, one, one, one person described it to me one time, we were doing an interview at his, at his house and the front yard kind of, you know, faces towards the, the land and, and the mountains and that type of thing. And the backyard's a sea and he's kind of like, yeah, the sea to a lot of people is just kind of in our backyards, it's kind of over there, whereas we always are kind of looking forward, right? Um, and, you know, even like uh, on the on the Dominica coat of arms, their slogan is um, in in Creole. It's uh, "Après Bondi, c'est la terre," which is you know essentially after God, it's the earth. You know, and so it just kind of highlights the focus, the importance on the on the earth and the soil. And historically, there hasn't been as much sort of focus on the sea, right? Um, and so you know, working with the fisheries division and other folks there, they're really trying to promote um, this love of fishing and. Um, you know, how you can make fishing something that, that that's not seen as like people's last resort and something that people might actually choose. Um, and one kind of interesting project that they do, that they used to do this is they invite fisher fishers and um, uh, who bring fish to schools around the island and sort of get youth engaged and you know get used get get the youth used to eating fish and just uh, interact with the fishers a little bit and you know trying to trying to spark that um, uh, just broader awareness of the importance of fisheries in a lot of these communities. Um, another kind of key part um, is increasing options um, for fishers to kind of like where they can sell their their catch once they get it. Um, uh, sorry, there. Um, so one of the things, so from some of the the data that we were collecting from the daily um, surveys, you know, what we're finding is about 73% of the catch 
from trips was sold directly to community members. Um, so the other, the other, you know, 20, 27% or whatever it is would be going to, um, uh, wholesale like restaurants and grocery stores and stuff like that. Um, one of the things like, uh, you know, one of the things that kind of caution. So yeah, this is often like, you know, increasing options to sell is pretty important part of a lot of different strategies to increase capacity. But one of the other things to kind of focus on is like, you, you, you still don't want to get rid of some of these direct marketing opportunities. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, what the quote there recognizes is that, you know, how um, people that are selling their fish to their communities, they kind of develop relationships with the people they're selling to. Um, and, you know, in a lot of cases, um, they actually enjoy kind of helping people out as well. And, you know, what this quote shows is that, you know, some of the fishers actually give their catch away sometimes to elderly or just other people that are in need. Um, and it kind of shows that how, you know, having these systems in place can help build some of the social capital that helps people get through situations. Um, these types of things were also really important um, after, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, where um, people, uh, you know, some of the fishers would 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 uh, would come and kind of hold, um, you know, fish back for some of the elders. So basically, they, when it, when fishers started going out again after Maria, they would come back and the docks would just be full of people that wanted to buy fish, right? Um, and and some of the fishers would actually hold some of the fish back for some of these elderly people that. Um, they knew wouldn't necessarily be at, at the at the start at the beginning of the line, so that they would just be able to have access to some of the catch. You know, so things like that can be really important. Um, you know, community-based mechanisms for increasing adaptive capacity. Um, another and kind of related um, element is just this idea of like how do you balance uh, some tech technology with traditional knowledge? And what this is showing here, this is a uh, one of the cooperative meetings where. Um, uh, during the meeting, there was a lot of sort of, you know, some of the younger, younger folk learning lessons from the, from the older folk is, it was interesting to kind of watch how that played out. Um, uh, you know, the older, the older folk would kind of tease the younger folk almost, but in, in some of the teasing, there was a lot of lessons and just a lot of knowledge being transmitted as well. Um, so it, yeah, it was definitely kind of an interesting process to, to watch. Um, and the other thing I would highlight here is just in the back here, you know, one kind of prime example. Um, so that's a deep freeze. Um, obviously, people use it to uh, keep their their fish um, fresh and healthy, that type of thing. Um, some of them, uh, so yeah, either these would be storing fish or they'd be used to store ice that fishers take with them on their daily trips. Um, that's obviously pretty important, you know, having access to this ice um, really in increases the quality of the fish that people are landing and makes it more healthy and, and all that kind of stuff. Make sure that none of it spoils and um, improves earnings and, you know, there's just a lot of benefits from it. But um, in Dominica, what people were finding, so uh, during Hurricane Maria, a lot of the electricity got cut off in different places. So there was this lack of ice and lack of kind of freezer technology that um, was impacting the fishers. So they didn't have the ice to go on their trips, but it was also impacting um, just, just like your, your, your regular community members as well, because they no longer had freezers in their house and stuff like that. Um, and uh, historically in these situations, you know, people would uh, dry fish or salt it and preserve it in different ways. Um, but, you know, that wasn't a very common pra practice anymore. And people had become pretty dependent on freezer technologies and, um, so, you know, when Hurricane Maria passed, people that, that knew how to do this were in pretty high demand for, you know, trying to train other people about how to, how to preserve fish and, you know, keep it healthy and that type of thing without access to electricity. And in some communities, it took, a, it took months for access to electricity to come back um, in, a, in a dependable way in Dominica, right? So, um, you know, just that, that's kind of one example where, you know, kind of blending, um, like in that case, like it's obvious, like, the freezers are a good thing. They provide a lot of benefits, but um, you have to just be careful. It doesn't crowd out some of these more traditional ways of, of doing things. Um, and I know I mentioned earlier about, it's not always about alternative livelihoods, but some cases it is too, right? Um, it's all about providing people with a lot of options um, to actually, you know, pursue the livelihoods and have the lives that they want. Um, and this is an, an example of, um, uh, trying to farm sea moss. So sea moss is like an algae, like a seaweed kind of thing. Uh, people use it in drinks. Um, I think in, in Canada, we used to harvest it off Newfoundland and use it in ice cream. I think it was, I, I think, I'm not totally sure about that, but um, basically when you mix it with water, it gets kind of kind of jelly-like. Um, so, and you know, it's got a lot of health benefits and stuff like that. So people use it for, for a broad range of things. Um, 
there's been a focus on trying to farm it in you know a lot of the different islands in the eastern caribbean for a while um, one of the concerns that's always raised is that a lot of the farming techniques draw on uh, non-native species of sea moss um, so what's what what we're doing here is um, this is a this is a, a wild species of of sea moss um, that was harvested in this area um, and what what um, this community in, in collaboration with the fisheries division was was experimenting with is like whether or not you can actually try to farm this wild version um, or this wild variety so um, what 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 they're doing is you kind of you collect the the algae it's got a little bit of a I don't know what you call it like a stalk or a root or something here um, you feed this kind of through a rope and you add a bunch kind of you know throw it across the rope and then you go and you'd lay this rope um, in some of the, the areas where, um, you know, sea mouse would, would naturally grow. Um, and uh, basically what this does is it, it, it most likely, you know, increases production, um, but also makes it a little bit easy, easy to gather. Otherwise, you have to go out here and search. There's a lot of like really sharp corals and things like that that are, you know, kind of dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so, you know, in some ways this, this uh, provides, um, you know, a little bit of, a, of an alternative to, you uh, uh, just sort of, you know, other, other kinds of livelihoods and, and, and stuff like that. Um, I would mention too, they're also, they're always trying to develop um, for CMOS in particular um, uh, export markets, just because it, it does have a use in a broad range of things. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's one kind of potential um, alternative livelihood in some of these coastal communities. So just in summary, um, some of the key points that I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, summarize for y'all. Um, but essentially, you know, adaptive capacity has its roots in multiple disciplines. It's studied using a diverse range of methodological tools. Um, moving forward, it's probably that we're going to need like a mix of these tools to actually, you know, make more progress on adaptive capacity. Both understanding how it works from an academic standpoint, but also how do you actually promote it in the real world. Um, we need to do this both, you know, related to that point, we need to both sort of build and apply theory regarding adaptive capacity in order to meet the urgency of a lot of sustainability problems. Um, the two kind of go hand in hand, but, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges sometimes that that sort of latent element of adaptive capacity that I mentioned makes it sort of, it's difficult to measure directly. So um, sometimes building theory can be, can be a little bit of a challenge um, uh, in terms of adaptive capacity research. Um, and finally, you know, as, as I hope you can see from just the stuff I was showing you in Dominica, um, these things are, you know, context is really important to how these things play out. And you know, there might, see, might be some commonalities across context a little bit, but essentially doing these things needs to be really rooted in place. Um, and uh, just like the, the types of futures and the types of strategies that people actually want to see in these areas. That's all I have for you for today. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it and yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, oh, sorry. Who spoke? I'm sorry. Uh, it was it was Adam, but I, uh, you go first. Do you have a question, Adam? No, just wanted to um, say thank you, Jeremy. That was great. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy, for your presentation. Does anyone has a question? Please raise your hand or post it on the chat box, please. Colette, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I'm happy to jump in first. Um, that was really great, Jeremy. I um, Obviously, I know you and I know your work, and so it's been really great to follow some of that work um, over time, um, but I really like the sort of dimensions that you highlighted. Um, when I, um, I have several questions, but I guess I'll start with, um, I was really interested, I really love the example you showed of, you know, like the, the traditional and balancing it with technology. Um, there's a number of projects where we're talking about in particular linking to technology related to telephones, for instance, yep. um, and how this can help, you know, touch on a couple of points that you mentioned. So find people to be able to sell your fish more easily, finding clients and have a reliable clientele. Um, and make it so that, you know, different, like across society, so younger members as well as older members, women and men can access that technology and, and be sort of visible in the value chain. Um, and I like the balance that you introduced that, you know, at multiple levels, um, that's great. And also to remember some of the traditional practices. So I was just wondering in terms of the, you know, you mentioned the policy framework in which it sits. And so is some of that recognized? And if so, particularly when talking about 
about building adaptive capacity in policy, how is that reflected or, or are there attempts to, to sort of incorporate some of that? Yeah, so um, this, this group right here actually was really interested in using um, ICTs or like phones and stuff like that, um, a little bit more so in, in some of their fishing practices. Um, I would say, you know, just stepping back a little bit, like policy is, is kind of a, an interesting thing in Dominica, you know what I mean? There's not a lot of formal policies written down, but there still is sort of informal policies that are just kind of um, whatever, like they, they're actualized through like what the fisheries division is doing and the priorities that it gets from um, the fishers and also political priorities and stuff like that. But um, so anyways, that was actually one thing um, that we we're, we we're working on with this community in particular. And um, uh, so those, those daily fishing trips that I mentioned that the, or the daily fishing surveys, um, we collect a lot of that data using tablets that, um, uh, in this case, so like the, the original plan was to get everybody in this community, a, a cell phone or something like that, that they could take with them. Um, it, it wasn't really, it was hard to, it was hard to operationalize that for a number of reasons, but also essentially a lot of them had better phones that we could actually buy them. So it didn't really make much sense. Right. Um, uh, and then, you know, what, it, what it came down to is just things like, um, access to internet and stuff like that were, were a bigger deal. And, um, uh, this, that's the type of thing, like if I was there doing this research, we probably would be able to, to, to work on that a little bit more. Um, but, um, the way that we ended up doing it is more, we worked through a, a data collector who's kind of a part of the, of the fishing group. Um, she actually sells a lot of the, a lot of the catch, you know, makes it into sandwiches and stuff like that, sells at roadside. But anyways, so when she was going around to purchase the fish she would use, she would um, take this tablet that we gave her and kind of go through um, a daily survey. Um, and that was, you know, feeding into the, the fisheries division sort of um, data collection protocols and all that kind of stuff. So it's like an official government thing, but then we got to use the data for, for research as well. Um, just stepping up back a little bit too. So there's been uh, kind of like the history of projects in, in these areas. So um, the the woman that we worked through is actually a trained data collector too. You know, she's, she's got like some official training um, just because uh, there's been sort of a history of trying to get that going, right? And um, as is probably um, common to a lot of places like this, that you get in the situation where there's like some kind of development project comes through with five years of funding, gets so far, trains a bunch of data collectors, goes away for a little bit there's no funding for a little bit everything kind of falls down then you know Jeremy from Canada comes and you know what I mean there's just like that kind of stuff happening all the time um so uh you know it is kind of a, a priority here but it still is kind of hard to get it off and sort of fully operationalize it um coming back to the, to the whole idea of um how does it link to uh traditional um knowledge and just making sure you're not like eroding some of that stuff um the uh uh it, it, I think it would depend a little bit on how it was working. So, you know, it, if people were using that to kind of share more, it could actually maybe facilitate um, uh, some of the preservation of, of some of that knowledge as well. Um, but if people were using it to maybe replace it, then it, it, would, it would potentially erode it, right? So I think it would still come down to like how people are actually using the technology to know if it would be like problematic in that sense or not. No. Thank Did you. That's your question. Yeah, no problem. Yes. Yeah, no, awesome. And I'll follow up afterwards as well. Nathan's got a question there. Yes, Nathan. Can you unmute, please? Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for the presentation, Jeremy. Uh, really, uh, really fascinating and really nice, rich narrative of, uh, of this case study. Um, I, I want to dig into this, this uh, and, and nice to see you as well. It's been a long time. Yeah, I see you too. <laughs> um, I, I want to dig into this, um, you know, this, this conversation about building the theory a little bit um, because I feel like uh, adaptive capacity is one area of social theory that uh, where there's just this huge amount of assumptions exactly um, yep. right like like we we I feel like there's so many untested elements including those that are listed in in the Synodal framework and paper. I feel like uh, they, they, they've kind of, they've become these ideas that we've attached ourselves to over time, but, I, but a lot of those um, individual elements have not actually been empirically tested uh, that I've seen. I mean, even, even uh, um, things that we, that we make, you know, wholesale assumptions about like uh, level of formal education, I've heard that one come up a lot, and yet I've never ever seen anybody test whether or not level of formal education does indeed lead, uh, is more likely to lead to a you know a proactive and positive adaptation versus a maladaptation, right? I and so uh, 
Yeah, you know, I, we also don't know, for example, you know, if you have a suite of different fat, uh, factors that can lead to adaptive capacity, what, what happens when one increases adaptive capacity and another one mm -hmm. is at the same time undermining that adaptive capacity yep. uh, because of its presence or, or absence. Uh, so that, you know, we don't know how these different elements come together. So all of that to say, you know, uh, just to ask for your thoughts and your insights on, you know, what is the, what is the, what is the path forward to, to kind of building this theory, the adaptive capacity theory, so that it is more uh, empirically grounded and so that it's more robust. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's all. I completely agree with all of that. That it is, it is, there's a ton of assumptions in there. Um, you know, and that they really fall into this camp where a lot of people have made these assumptions about indicators and they kind of document them, which is, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't want to criticize that work, but, um, you know, there is kind of this need to then, like you're saying, empirically verify these. Um, I can tell you. So um, the approach that we're using in our project, whether or not we'll be successful is another question, you know, invite me back in a year and I'll let you know kind of thing. But um, one of the things that we're doing in some of the work that, that I've been working on um, in Dominica, but also in the Galapagos and in Uruguay is, you know, using this framework as a starting point and then trying to measure uh, different variables or different indicators related to each one of these, as well as some outcome variables over time. Um, we have in the Galapagos and in Uruguay, um, we have these like really long term data sets of uh, things like, you know, uh, basically like fisheries economic stuff, catch per unit effort and just, just all that kind of stuff that go back in time. So we can kind of see like, you know, at the individual fisher level, um, how they've been able to address some of these things. Um, we're augmenting that with um, uh, uh, kind of like, you know, cross sectional surveys at points in times that gets at different um, you know, elements of these frameworks. And then uh, we're using sort of two analytical approaches to get at it. Because, um, you know, the one thing you mentioned that I think is really important, this whole idea that um, these things never really work in, in isolation. And, you know, I tried to highlight some of that in my talk a little bit, but, you know, essentially it's agency and learning or it's agency and organization and things like that, that end up influencing how um, adaptive capacity plays out. So, um, what we're trying to do to get at um, some of the interactions between variables is using like Bayesian network analysis. So that's kind of this inductive approach where you um, you you have like a set of variables and um, you 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 feed it to an algorithm that inductively shows you um, how these different variables have are are, are most likely interacting. It's kind of a prob prob probability based model, kind of a probabilistic model, um, and then you can see like how those variables interact and how they potentially lead to outcomes or not. So that's kind of one th one way we've been doing that. In addition to like just the, some of the qualitative work that we've been working on, um, and the other piece and. Uh, I think about this part a lot too, and this gets at the whole idea that in a lot of cases, um, adaptive capacity is latent. So it's like really hard to measure, really hard to think about. Um, but uh, I find the logic of qualitative comparative analysis, where you're talking about necessary and sufficient conditions, is kind of interesting when you think about um, adaptive capacity because um, like it gets at the whole idea that like a necessary condition, for example, um, it has to be there for the outcome to, to be observed. So for example, you need a cooperative for people in a certain community to be, um, to have high well-being or something like that, whatever outcome you're interested in. But every time you have a cooperative, it's not necessarily that they're going to have high well-being, right? So from a statistical standpoint, that can be kind of tricky to um, really tease out because they're probably not correlated, right? You know what I mean? Um, but nonetheless, you can use some of the logic of QCA to start digging apart some of those analyses. And we've, we've been using that on the same kind of data set. So, you know, we use the... Uh, the uh, the Bayesian networks to see how things are interacting. Then we do sort of necessary and sufficient conditions analysis to kind of see um, which of the conditions um, are maybe more or less necessary um, in terms of leading to the outcome. So that was that was you know um, that's kind of where we're headed with some of the stuff that we're working on. I'm not saying that's the only way, you know, but that's that's just yeah some thoughts on on how we've we've approached it so far. Yeah, great examples. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Nathan, do you have another question? Well, I always have other questions, but I, I'd rather <laughs> pass it on to other people. That was a, that was a fantastic response. Thanks, Nathan. There is there is a second question from Colette. Awesome. Um, I was going to say, yeah, I'm happy to ask other questions, but I'm happy to also just have a moment um, if anybody else wants to step in, either from yeah to respond to what you you just provided as additional sort of comments. Um, uh, encourage everyone to sort of step up and step in. 
Um, my question otherwise was just going to be quickly, um, you know, like you mentioned the uh, Hurricane Maria and how that affected the communities and the adaptive capacity that they demonstrated to that particular event. Um, and in light of the pandemic, um, I was just curious as to whether some of the approaches that you know they that, that they used or that where they demonstrate adaptive capacity has been similar or whether it's been quite different and i know it's it's a little bit hard to say because the pandemic is still ongoing but just first reflections yeah. i guess yeah i think one area where it's maybe been similar is where i was talking about um this piece i think where you know um some so people are in need um there's some of these relationships built um uh, that can, you know, help make sure that some of those people in need can actually get some fish and stuff like that. Um, I haven't done, you know, like I, I keep in touch with a lot of people down there, but I haven't been, I haven't been there for a while. And I haven't done work there for a while. So, um, you know, I don't really want to speculate too much about some other things, but this is one that I've kind of heard has, has happened. Um, uh, I would mention those like in one of the ways in that Nathan Engel paper, um, one of the ways that he suggests moving forward with adaptive capacity assessments is that you can use sort of, um, proxy events, right? And so in some ways, the pandemic does offer like, not necessarily saying it's going to play out exactly the same, but the pandemic does kind of offer like from a research standpoint, um, you can kind of understand how these communities might respond to climate change or other things just by seeing how they respond to the pandemic. Um, and so we've been doing that's some of the work we've been doing in, in the Galapagos has looked at like, how um, Kind of two main findings from that work, um, working with my colleagues down there, Marisa Castrohan and, and, and Charles Darwin Foundation, but um, essentially uh, people really had to modify their um, selling strategies. So before there's a lot more tourism in the Galapagos, a lot of people were selling to tourists. Um, they kind of uh, started selling directly more so and they developed these like really quickly, they developed things like, you know, WhatsApp groups or um, just methods for getting to the public a little bit easier because they, they didn't really have those before. Um, uh, and the other thing there that was really interesting is more kind of related to the positioning of fishers in society, but um, at least for a while. So fishers in the Galapagos where it really is focused on conservation, fishers have been, you know, demonized quite a bit or they, they, they get beat up a lot in the news and that type of thing or this public perception. Um, whereas like when they were like one of the main sources of, 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 of local protein, um, Galapagos, by the way, was cut off from mainland Ecuador during some of the shutdowns, right? So they're, you know, not easy to get food and stuff like that. Um, and fishers were able to provide some of that. They were actually kind of reframed more as heroes, right? Um, uh, helping people get through the pandemic. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. And yeah, like, the, you know, it's similar cases, like um, how that might apply to climate change and, you know, things like, uh, like in Dominica Hurricane Maria, when fishers are the ones that are providing local protein and it's hard for people to get food from otherwise, they do kind of get elevated a little bit in the communities, right? So there, there are kind of similar things that happen, I think, but um, yeah, it's, it's, I think, you know, the challenges of climate change or just other things might be a lot different than the pandemic too. No, thanks, Jeremy. Um, super insightful. Thank you. There is a question from William. William, thank you. Can you unmute, William? Yeah, I wasn't allowed to do so, but thanks for allowing me to do that. Uh, no, very interesting talk, uh, uh, Jeremy. And uh, uh, so my question is, um, I think maybe as remotely related to uh, what you're talking about is uh, in the um, in climate change um, literature and assessment, uh, uh, in addition to looking at the adaptive capacity, uh, there's also um, a lot of interest in looking at the, the limit to adaptation. Um, so in this case, I, I think uh, there's a certain capacity that the community can adapt to, for example, climate change or extreme events. Uh, uh, but then there's also a certain limit to that, uh, and I, I uh, it's, it's often, um, I think uh, I'm really interested to hear about uh, whether you have any thoughts of uh, the kind of approach that you're using would be able to help elucidate the, uh, the, the limit to uh, adaptation. And, uh, and particularly, I think it is relevant to the recent context of, uh, of COP26, for example, that highlights uh, the need to develop mechanisms to look at uh, loss and damage from climate change. And, and that relates a lot to uh, understanding what the limit to adaptation is. So any residual impact from, from climate change, uh, for example, under the loss and damage uh, mechanism would need to be compensated uh, somehow by, by other emitters, uh, climate emitters. Uh, so I, I'm just, uh, in some way, I, I want to uh, hear your thought about whether the kind of approach that you have developed and applied uh, would be uh, useful to explore those kind of dimensions about limited adaptation. 
Yep, I, I think they definitely could. And you know, so in, in some ways, like conceptually, at least like adaptive capacity and limits adaptation would be somewhat related, right? Um, like as you're pointing out, like they they do kind of, um, they're in the same vein, like the adaptive capacity can be thought about how much someone or a community can adapt. Um, so I think, I think it could be. Um, one of the things where if you wanted to, I think like when he's, one of the things that could be helpful from policy on, on some of this stuff, and I'm not sure the methods that I've used would, would, would necessarily get you there, but just thinking about sometimes limits to adaptation, there's a little bit more of a focus on actually quantifying where those limits are. Um, and, you know, some of the work that we do, we do community-based stuff, we give some sense about how you might quantify some of those limits, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not really directly translatable into um, kind of like a quantitative understanding of those limits per se, but, you know, through things like different types of modeling approaches or things like that, um, I think you, you, you could probably get at it a little bit. And, you know, so some of the stuff that we're doing on adaptive capacity can maybe inform how those models develop, um, but maybe not quite get there all on their own. Um, one example, and I think of, you know, Colin and I have talked a lot about some of this stuff before too, but so in, in this area, like I mentioned, um, the fishers in Dominica target a lot of pelagic species. So uh, where those species are migrating is really important. And if their migratory routes change, you know, so much, um, people just have like small boats they're going out after the, the fish with and stuff like that. There's gonna be kind of a limit to um, what things, like some of the things that I've mentioned, if the fish move too far, they're gonna have a, a, a challenge getting them, right? So, um, so yeah, we, we, you know, the work that I'm doing can maybe kind of highlight where some of those limits might be, but not put like a firm sort of quantification on them. That makes sense. No, that makes sense. Uh, thanks, thanks so much uh, for sharing your thoughts. No worries. Thank you. Sarah, you're the next one for the question. There we go. Hi. Um, so you mentioned the concept of alternative livelihoods. Um, and I'm just curious whether we're talking about alternative livelihoods or supplemental livelihoods in this concept. Yeah. Because our experience in the Philippines is that when we tried to introduce alternative livelihoods, in fact, people took all the livelihoods because they were so far below the poverty line, right? That they're not really like they'll do. But I also, so we think about it kind of in that concept, um, but where we have people have switched like to seaweed farming, yep. that's now all they do. And to me, it seems like I don't do diversity theory, but it, or um, adaptation theory, but it seems like diversity is good for that. And so I'm just curious in, in this case study, are we talking about alternative livelihoods and are you seeing kind of that when you introduce something like seaweed farming, there's a risk there of people pivoting to that and now there's yeah. no adaptability yeah. just as there was when everybody fished. So Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great, great question, great points. Um, I would say, I, yeah, like what I'm talking about is probably better called supplemental livelihoods, like where, yeah, I'm thinking like people are, um, uh, probably going to take on on more but exactly what you said is what i was going to say too is like some people will probably take it on fully um uh there's been a little bit of that seen in um in some some communities that i work in in in, in um saint lucia there's a small town called Pralin where um at least a couple sort of leaders have really taken like you know seaweed or like sea moss farming is like their main that's all they do now um but they kind of organize a bunch of the other people that um in, in that community anyways, they, they farm bananas, they go fishing, and now they do sea moss too, right? So there are some kind of like, um, the more kind of like a supplemental livelihood. So um, yeah, and then that's an interesting point around um, diversity. And that's, that that is a huge risk, right? Um, uh, so yeah, like assuming that they would be supplemental livelihoods, and they are like increasing the diversity or increasing the options for people, it's probably a good thing. But if it does happen, like, like, like you're saying, which is a, a possible scenario, right? Like that, um, people become focused on CMOS farming, it's probably going to be problematic for a lot of reasons, erode resilience and that type of thing. I, I would totally agree. Yeah, thank you so much. No worries. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. Next one is Adam. Oh, you're still on mute, Adam. I'm on mute. So I'm there you go. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you for that. That was great. I just had some questions about sort of like local collaborations because you mentioned that you um, collaborated kind of with the government, but I kind of wondered if you were also collaborating with sort of any local NGOs or academics in uh, Dominica itself. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So mostly, I, I mostly work with with um work the most closely with with government agencies. There's been a 
um, you know, a couple small NGOs that I've done some stuff with, but most of it's through um, the government agencies. There's not a ton of, of NGOs operating in Dominica. It's, it's you know, kind of different from some of the other islands that way. They're, they're, they're there, but they're, it's not like um, as apparent as, as, as in some of the islands. Um, and uh, one of the things, so like in terms of um, collaborators, I work a lot with students from Dominica more recently. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, I've had an undergraduate student from Dominica, a PhD student from Dominica, and um, PhD students there right now, Louis Hill, doing some some work on disaster preparedness and stuff like that. Um, and so, so, yeah, and there's not there's a there's not really a, there's like a medical university in Dominica. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah. Yeah, so most of my collaborations have been through government, but you know, try to collaborate as broadly as possible. Yes. That's great, thank you. Yeah. We work a bit with, with the cooperatives as well, I guess. The next question is for Andrea, and then we will quickly finish with Nathan. Great, thanks so much. Thank you, Jeremy, for the, the talk and joining us here today. It was really great to know more about your work. and. I was just hoping to, to hear a little bit more um, kind of in connection to Diane's recent comment in the chat about just your time on the ground since we have this opportunity to meet with you kind of behind the scenes of your research. Can you just yeah. share a little bit more about like your connection to, to the people? What really marked you about these experiences? What pulled you into this work? Yeah, um, yeah so, you know, Dominica, like originally honestly as a PhD student I was interested in it's known as like the nature island um I'd done some work on uh on St. Lucia before and they always say like Dominique is what St. Lucia used to look like so I had this general interest to to, to kind of work there um once I got there though like I I, I was connected originally with um, Norman Norris who's with the the, the fisheries division there um he kind of showed me around and um, you know, stuff like that and got to know the place a little bit more. Um, I was always just struck like Dominique is a pretty, I don't know, it's a pretty laid back place. People kind of watch out for each other a lot. Um, it's the type of place where, um, so they have like uh, kind of buses that go right around the island. And it's the type of place where you could like say, you could tell somebody that's, that's on a bus saying like, you know, I want you to give this money to somebody that's on the other end of the island. They would take it there and kind of give it to them, right? So there's a lot of kind of, I know that just as a social scientist, there's a lot of um, really interesting sort of you know, trust and social capital and stuff like that. It kind of really, really drew me to the place. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and I don't know, like since then, like, uh, so Revere Sebastian, um, he's become a pretty good friend of mine just over the years working, working there. Um, he's been up, I've, he's come to Canada a couple of times, hang out while you're in this work and his daughter lives in, um, uh, New York. So she's, you know, visited Toronto a couple of times. We've kind of hung out with her quite a bit up, up here. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of, I guess, some of the connections that I've formed as to the people and the places and stuff like that. And does that answer your question? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And finally, the last question from Nathan. Sure. Uh, so, so, Jeremy, when, when thinking about this whole realm of social adaptive capacity and resilience, I think a lot about the idea of the phoenix. Uh, and, you know, the, the story of the phoenix is, right, that, uh, that the, 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 the phoenix burns, and then after it burns, it rises from the ashes. Um, and, I th and I think about this just in the context of the critiques of kind of adaptive capacity and resilience focus at the local level, you know, the local trap or the, uh, you know, what the, the New York Times a couple of years ago called the profound emptiness of resilience, uh, you know, and uh, so, it, it, you know, and I'll just bring it to like to a, an example that's happening right now, right? Let's, like, if we're talking about the, the farmers in the Fraser Valley right now, and the flooding that's happening there, I, you know, I think about uh, whether a, whether a community or an individual focus on resilience would be enough uh, in a case where 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 the you know the the structures that are beyond that the the the, the you know the engineering structures and some of the broader yeah. institutional structures have really led to a situation where where they've they they've just been pushed into a trap. Um, so I don't know, just a just a you know asking you to chat a little bit about the the you know the multi scalar elements of adaptive capacity yeah. and and how that, how that comes in. Yeah. So one of the things I didn't mention when we were going through, um, but one of the things that I find that's kind of missing in the center framework is that idea of structure more so and just how these broader um, sort of structural dimensions influence adaptive capacity 
um, uh, constrain it, enable it, that type of thing. Um, it's kind of captured a little bit in, you know, organization, but um, some of that, some of those ideas around like, you know, even when you think about built structures, there's path dependency and that type of thing. Those aren't really captured here. Um, from a social standpoint, there's like structural dimensions of power and things like that that are kind of captured in agency, but not necessarily fully or not necessarily how everyone would capture them. So I think it's a little bit missing. Um, some of the original coming back to vulnerability and, you know, vulnerability scholarship, it's, it's, it's not um, like vulnerability scholarship. A lot of times there's kind of an ethical concern using vulnerability scholarship because um, just you're always calling people vulnerable, right? Which is, which is problematic. Um, but some of this scholarship started to get into some of the structural determinants a little bit more. So thinking about things of power um, and any of that type of thing. Um, but, but yeah, it is kind of lacking in some of the adaptive capacity work and, you know, it's, it's probably really important. It's probably a compliment, right? Like agency is important, but um, if you're not taking in, into account some of those structural dimensions, um, you're probably not painting a whole picture of what's actually happening and what can be better there. Um, I don't know a lot about that example that, that you're mentioning, um, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's just some of my general thoughts on, on, you know, how some of this stuff might, might work. Thank you, Jeremy. That was um, great, really interesting. Um, so I'd like to thank Dr. Pittman on behalf of the UBC's Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries. And in general, it was fantastic. I think everyone can agree on that.